I think that's for the kid. You all can hear me. Yeah. Right? And you guys all have what you need, right? Well, first of all, Mary, thank you um, for inviting me here and for giving me the opportunity to, um, uh, to tour and to learn about this business, not only what you do every day, but how it started and what the motivations were to start it. I, you know, um, my kids have often asked me about my motivations for getting into this kind of life. And I've always said that I always felt like being in public life like this, it was like going back to school every day. When I was governor, I always felt like every day I was learning something new because I would do things like this, where you come and meet people who have had great ideas, who put them into motion, and then inspire and lead others who have really good ideas to come and help them expand and grow and do what they need to do. And it's, it's what's so wonderful about this country is that we present the opportunity to be able to do this and that people with good ideas can get that done and can also provide extraordinary opportunities for both financial and personal growth for other people, both in their careers and, and for their own families. And so um, I really appreciate yeah, you having me here. do the introduction. Well, go ahead. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just introduced myself, I guess. Uh, Marion, thank you. And um, and thank you all of you. Look, I'm, I'm not going to give a long speech here today because it's a, you know, this is a group where I'd much rather take questions about what's on your mind. I, I would just say this. I think that we're at a stage now um, in this country where we need to have a president again who actually knows what they're doing. And that seems like kind of would be a very low bar to clear, um, but I think we've missed the mark on a number of occasions here of late. Um, you know, with Donald Trump, you know, somebody who has run a business like his, um, thinking that he can come in and run something like the federal government. Um, there are some places that he was able to make some good, but for the most part, um, you can't run it like a business that runs golf courses um, and hotels. It's different. Government is different. Um, we were talking about this upstairs in a meeting we had before that um, you know, government doesn't have a profit motive. And so much of what everybody does every day is geared towards trying to make sure you have the money to make your pay well, your money to expand your business, your money to be able to invest in new technology and all the rest. And the government does that by coercion, right? We just take your money um, in taxes. And so there's not the same kind of motive. You need to have a different point of view and a different experience set to come in and run something like that than someone who runs a business. And you also need the energy to run something as large and as vast as the federal government. And unfortunately, I think the president we have now, who I've known for 40 years, because we, uh, we Mary Pat and I went to the University of Delaware, as did he, um, and so I've known him from when I was a college student, um, just no longer has the energy to be able to do the things that really are required of somebody to be in that job and to do it well. And so we've got all this discontent among people about potentially the two choices that we have. Um, and that's one of the reasons I got into this race was because I was discontent too. I thought to myself, well, you know, we need to do better than this. And in a country of 330 million people, it seems to me we should do better than two guys who are going to be a combined 160 years old on election day to be president of the United States and to try to lead this country and the rest of the, the free world um, in all the challenges that we have. And, you know, we talked today about the cost of capital and, and inflation and what it's meant to everybody in this room and all the people that you represent here. And it's predominantly occurring because the government just spends too much money. And so instead of it being real money, it's printed money. And the more you print more of that money, um, the more your interest rates are going to go up. And you're seeing it with everybody in, in a state like New Hampshire where the housing is challenging and expensive to begin with. When you add on to that interest rates that are three and four times more than what they were just a few years ago, it makes it impossible for people to be able to afford to buy a house. So, you know, one of the things that I would do really, really immediately once I became president was to send us back to pre-COVID levels of spending. We have like a $1.7 trillion deficit this year. It's numbers that are so big that it's hard to even imagine that much money. If we went back to pre-COVID levels of spending, that would take the deficit immediately down to $700 billion. 
just by going back to spending everything we were spending before COVID started. And I think we can all agree that COVID is pretty much over. It's certainly over as a national crisis where you have thousands of people dying a day. And you needed to support a lot of different things, both from a public health perspective and from a business perspective, to keep things afloat while we were dealing with the, with the epidemic. But now, you have people in Washington who want to continue to spend that money at that rate, because it's much easier to say yes when you're in government to say no, because also we're spending your money, and at this point, your grandchildren's money, um, on what we're doing today, and that's that's wrong. So we do that very early on, and putting spending down, doing that will bring interest rates down. Doing that will make it easier for businesses to expand at a more affordable rate for them to borrow money. And just as importantly, we'll make it easier for all of you to be able to do that when you want to buy a home or you want to buy a car or you're helping to finance a college education for your children or whatever it is you're doing where the cost of capital is going to impact upon that. The government has to play their role in making sure that we do that much better than what we're doing. And I dealt with that when I was governor of New Jersey. When I came in, my, my predecessor left me with an $11 billion deficit on a $29 billion budget. So more than a third in debt. And unlike the federal government, we can't print money. So I had to have it balanced. Um, or else I'm dying in the Constitution. And so we eliminated 832 individual programs in my first year to get the budget into balance. And I will tell you that what happened when I did that was my popularity went from like 55% to 38 Because everyone in those programs had a constituency. But I would do the same thing if I became president, so be ready. Because I have to do that. Because I'm spending your money. Irresponsibly spending your money. And if you think about it, the presidential race we had 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, George Bush and Al Gore were arguing about how to spend the surplus. And now we're in debt, 1.7 trillion, we have 33 trillion dollars in our overall national debt. And I want you to understand what both Donald Trump and Joe Biden have done to our country. Of the $33 trillion in national debt that we've accumulated over our 250 years in existence, $14 trillion of it has been run up in the last seven years. $14 trillion of $33 trillion in the last seven years? It's crazy, and it's not sustainable. And it's going to turn our country into something we don't want it to be. So we need to, to work on that. And, and I think that would be the first job of a new president is to deal with that. And I'll just talk about one thing away from home. We have fires burning around this world, and I think we have them burning in large part because there are people, bad actors around the world, who are trying to test us. Folks in China, in Russia, in North Korea, in Iran, who are trying to test us and try to convince our friends around the world that we're not reliable friends. It's a big test for us. You, know, you look at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and I have some people who come to town home and say, like, why is that our problem? Well, it's our problem because we made a promise to Ukraine 31 years ago. When the Soviet Union fell, Ukraine had nuclear weapons that were part of the old Soviet Union. And we asked them to return those nuclear weapons to Russia. Ukraine's like, yeah, we've been under Russian rule for a long time here. We like to keep the nuclear weapons. We promise them, if you return them, we'll defend your territorial integrity. Um, Russia's invaded them a few times now, and we've allowed it to continue. So other friends around the world have to be looking at what's going on in Ukraine and say, are we a reliable friend anymore? Are we a reliable partner? Are we good to our word? That's why I support helping to fund Ukraine fight the war against Russia, because we gave them our word. And unlike other countries around the world, we don't have to buy our friends. Our friends are our friends because they can count on us. Well, can they? And the same thing happening in Israel. It's awful what's happening over there. It's awful the way the terrorists, uh, terrorists of Hamas attacked them on October 7th, killed 1,200 innocent people, kidnapped 240 more. And now, Israel retaliating. You know, there comes a point where we have to stand with our friends and say, you know, that initial attack was unwarranted, was unjustified, and we can't count on Hamas to be a reliable or friendly neighbor anymore to Israel. 
they ever were, but now they're openly hostile. And they say, as recently as this week, they'd like to repeat October 7th again. That's not something that we can stand by and allow to happen. And what you see across the country now with this expression of anti-Semitism as well is very dangerous for us because today it's anti-Semitism. I became U.S. Attorney in New Jersey. I was nominated on September 10th, 2001. So the next day the job became very different from the job I accepted the day before. And what we have in New Jersey, the immediate aftermath of 9 11, we had the second most citizens in the country murdered on 9 11. So we had a lot of anger inside our state and a lot of sense of loss, rightfully so. But then we also had a lot of acting out against Muslim Americans in our state who had nothing to do with what happened on September 11th, but people were acting out against them. My point is that as different things happen in the course of history, to the extent we allow any group to be bullied and ridiculed and murdered because of their religion, we're next in line. Whatever we are, whatever way you practice your religion, the person who's in the crosshairs today will be different tomorrow. We've seen that just in the last 20 years. Horrible anti-Muslim activity 20 years ago, now horrible anti-Semitic activity now. We can't have that in this country, and we need a president who's going to stand up and say that all of it's wrong. And not dog whistle it, so that people who are angry feel like, well, maybe they'll put a stub on the scale for or against a certain group. It's not the way it should be. So we have big problems around the world, too, that we have to deal with, and we don't have a lot of time to really dally over it. And if you look at what's happening down in Congress, we have a southern border problem. 200,000 people on average a month trying to cross the border illegally every month for the last 11 months. And they're down in Washington, they want to go home for Christmas. And they haven't given aid to Ukraine, they haven't given aid to Israel, and they haven't funded fixing the border and securing it. Uh, to me, you know, they should be in detention. And they should be kept down there until they come to an agreement, be forced to fix the problem. A president can do that. They can really force them to try to do it. President Biden doesn't seem to be doing it. Uh, you know, I think that's what a president needs to do is provide that leadership and say, I'm not going home for Christmas, and neither are you. Because there are big problems both at home and around the world that need to be fixed. And that's, by the way, if you've forgotten what you got hired to do. They take a lap, you know, victory lap around the Capitol when they don't close the government. Or they only take three weeks to elect the Speaker. These are the things that they think they should be getting a gold star for. You know, we need to have a new sense of what those responsibilities mean. And that's what I try to do as president as well. I did it in New Jersey with a legislature of the other party. We don't have to hate the other party. In fact, I don't think we should. They're all Americans. Their ideas are just different. And we got to find a way back in this country where compromise is not a dirty word. I suspect in this business you do it every day. So it's a compromise with coworkers, colleagues, to get a job done. Why shouldn't the people who run government be held to the same standard that you are? And that's the kind of standard I'm going to try to hold them to if I'm president. So there's lots of other conversations I hope we have. Um, I appreciate you giving me a couple of minutes to meet all of you and talk to you and to host me here. It's a pretty good looking open space here. I like it. I feel like I'm in the ski lodge. It's pretty good. Um, but I'm happy to take questions from you about anything that's on your mind, stuff I mentioned, stuff that I didn't mention. Yes, sir. Um, you distinguish yourself by being willing to call out distinction from, say, Trump. The scariest thing, I guess, is four policy questions. Yeah. The scariest thing that I've heard sort of articulated during the campaign was when he was saying, oh, yeah, 24 hours I'd have a peace deal between Ukraine and Russia. Frightening, of course, because Putin isn't going to give away anything. And so what he's really saying is we'll apply pressure to our friends. Yep. To, to cave. To cave. And the same kinds of pressures are, are 
let's say, subterranean, but the physical in terms of what's going on with Israel. I feel like this is a moment for a Churchillian leader. I'm not a negotiator. And I wonder if you'd like to expand on your ideas. I guess you were talking in terms of friendship, you know, our, our friends, keeping our word. But it feels like a civilizational moment. It feels like barbarians are at the gates again. Well, they are. And, and look, we have to understand that um, those four countries, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, are working together. When I went to Israel, I'm the only candidate who went to Israel after October 7th, because I wanted to see it for myself. And when I went there, one of the things I saw at a military base outside Jerusalem were the weapons that they had um, confiscated from Hamas terrorists during the battle. There were Russian manufactured AK-47s. There were Iranian rockets with the markings from the Iranian government on them. And there were North Korean rocket propelled grenades. I mean, to think that they're not all in this together is, is just to be naive. And so we understand that we're up against some evil actors. And believe me, if they're watching us, this is what we need to be worried about even more. And there's some news that came out today on this, that the president of China told Biden in San Francisco, we're reunifying with Taiwan. Um, that's a nice way of putting they're going to go and take it over. Because the people of Taiwan don't want to be reunified with mainland China. They're watching what we do with Russia and Ukraine. They're funding that war. And we need to show them that we're going to not permit aggressive action like this to happen unchecked. And the great thing about Ukraine is I went there too um, in August and met with President Zelensky. And one of the things he said to me was, we'll never permit American soldiers in this war. Please assure every American you talk to, we won't permit it. Because we've been occupied by Russia and we didn't like it too much. And with all due respect, we won't be occupied by you either. What we want are the weapons we need to fight the Russians and drive them back over the border. We don't want American men and women here fighting and dying. And so it seems to be a pretty good investment for us. You know, we've invested 5% of our overall military budget in this. And they've degraded over 50% of the Russian military hardware. Yet, for some reason, we're sitting around, we're hesitating. So, look, I think the, the, the point you make about Churchill is exactly right. That there were many people who were for capitulating when the bombing of Great Britain was going on in 1940. And it was Churchill who said, you know, we get into this, we're lost. Our freedom is gone. There are moments where we have to draw a line in the sand and, and be counted. And I think this is one of those moments for our country as a leader of free countries in the world. Because if we don't stand up now, they're going to make deals with the other guys. Because they're weaker. And they've got to try to protect themselves somehow. And so if we're not going to be willing to stand up and unite the other countries with us to stand up against these four, then we're handing it over. And everything that we fought for for the last 250 years starts to disintegrate. And we can feel that inside. And when you hear Trump say he'll figure it out in 24 hours, you know what he means. He says nice things about Putin. He's going to turn it over to him. And he's going to argue to all of you that that's being America first. What he means by America first is America alone. And I don't think America's ever been first by being alone. And be careful about filling up the moat and pulling up the drawbridge and thinking we're going to be protected. Because most of the people in this room were alive and thinking on September 11th of 2001. We are not immune from being attacked ourselves. And as weapons get more and more sophisticated, it's more and more possible. So, you know, people who want to put this off, put it off at their own risk. And we're either going to pay now or pay later. And usually when we pay later, we pay a lot more, not only in terms of money, but in terms of lives. So that's the way I would approach it. Thank you. Other questions from anybody about anything? Yes, ma'am. Yep. So look, I think you start off by 
you absolutely have a right to know what I think about climate change. And I think climate change is real. And I think human activity contributes to it. And we have to just own that. It, it seems to me to be so obvious. But to think otherwise is just sticking your head in the sand. So now how do we deal with it? We talk about this upstairs a little bit about the, you know, we can't regulate our way exclusively to a solution because people will resist it and, and not comply. Who do I mean? Well, inside the country, like I have no problem with electric vehicles, it's fine, but it should be electric vehicles that people actually want to buy, not electric vehicles that we're forcing them to buy. And I was saying, we have a friend who's one of the largest car dealers in the Mid-Atlantic, and he told me that he's got a 12-month inventory of electric cars. This means nobody wants them. And, and by the way, they're practically giving them away between the federal tax credit you get and the state tax credits in most states you get. So what I would do is this. First, I think we have to make sure that we use nuclear much more than we are. In New Jersey, one of the most densely populated states in the country, 53% of our electricity is generated by nuclear power, safely, for the last 50 years. And so why can't we do that all over the country? And that adds nothing to the carbon footprint. It's a clean energy that's also reliable and can run the grid in a way that when you flip the switches here, everything goes on. Second, I think for here in New England, we should be building natural gas pipelines to New England. You should not be reliant almost solely on home heating oil to heat your homes in the winter. It's horrible for the environment, worse than natural gas is. And we should be building those pipelines here. And the fact that New York stops those pipelines from being built from Pennsylvania up here in New England, I think is short-sighted environmentally. Because then it's not like you're you know, getting powered by wind or solar right now to heat your homes. You're burning home heating oil. And it's also short-sighted economically because of the cost. Third, we have to continue to invest in things like solar, nuclear, hydropower, hydrogen. All those things we should continue to invest in because America has always been the innovator. So I would invest in all those things, but we can't force them to be ready. You all know this working in a company like this. You can inspire people to do more. You can come up with great ideas that you put into practice in that manufacturing facility. But if it's not ready, it's not ready. And so we need to continue to invest to make it ready. But it's not going to be there to support the bulk of what we need right now. And also, this country's done pretty well in the last 10 years. We've lowered our carbon output by a billion tons a year, every year for the last 10 years. At the same time, the Chinese have increased theirs by 5 billion. And they are burning coal over there like nobody else in the world. And so the last piece of dealing with the environment, um, at least on the carbon side, is to say we need to make it a diplomatic priority with China to get them to understand that they're ending the world. And that they have to be a part with 1.4 billion people. If they're not in on trying to help to keep the environment clean, we're just running on a treadmill and getting nowhere, even with all the good things we've done in this country. And the rest of the world has done too. China is now one of the biggest, it is the biggest polluter in the world. So diplomatically, you have to go at and them and try to incentivize them and negotiate with them to lower that down. Because if you don't do it, we're not going to be able to fix the problem globally. And on, on clean water, look, I, I think that we've made great strides in this country in terms of making sure that our water is clean and remains clean. But the bigger problem on water is supply. And when you go, especially to parts of the Southwest, you're having real supply crises. And so we need to continue to work on technology, on desalinization, and other things to make it even better than what it is now, so that we can have a more abundant supply of water than what we've got. And working on conservation tools in certain parts of the country to not waste water. Because in the end, it's not only does it have to be clean, it has to be available. And I don't think we're focusing on that enough either. Right, I think I'll take one more. Right. Yeah. Someone else raised their hand. Who was it? I saw somebody. Uh, Go ahead, Tim. And my question is, uh, New Jersey is known for its fairly high test scores, despite all the complexities of a small density 
Ohio State. Uh, can you expand on what lessons you have learned in that field and what you would be prioritizing in education across the country? We do have pretty high test scores. I, I think that it's less because of our public education system than it is because of the nature of the people who are living there and the priority they put on education. Um, our public school system is very good, but it's not great. And it has huge gaps. So in our state, you know, our urban areas are performing significantly under um, our suburban areas. And for years, people have made the excuse it's because of the uh, you know, socioeconomic differences, and that contributes to it. But also, we're not demanding the very best out of the folks down there. We're not demanding it out of our teachers. We're not demanding it out of the families. And we're not demanding it out of the students. And we're not giving them options when school for the schools fail. Um, the fact is, I, I'll give you an example of two examples in New Jersey, in two of our bigger urban areas in Newark. Um, we went to a merit pay system for teachers, um, and we brought out teachers that were failing and were not doing well. And we expanded charter schools and Renaissance schools, which did things like have kids in school 11 months a year, have kids in school until 6 o'clock at night, um, having school available on Saturday mornings, because these children were falling behind. And you're not going to catch up for them with them not putting more time in and us not putting more time in. With that expansion, you saw test scores go up significantly in the city of Newark. In the city of Camden, which was the worst operational school district in our state, we opened up the entire school district, every one of the schools and charter schools, and no longer matter where you live in Camden, you pick which school you want to go to. And when that competition was set up, change in Camden has been incredible. You've seen reading scores go up 60% in the last 10 years. Math scores go up 48% in the last 10 years. And it's because we're teaching in a different way. I think public education is not succeeding as well as it should right now because it doesn't tailor the education to the condition you find the children in. Children in one particular socioeconomic setting have different needs than one where they don't have parents at home because they're working two or three jobs. There's no one there to help them with their homework. There's no one there to encourage them to do their work. Well, if that happens, oh, do we give up on those children? You know, I don't think we can. I think it's immoral to give up on them. So that's why you have to have a longer school day and a longer school year for kids in those circumstances. When they go home to an empty house and no one there to help them or encourage them. Why not keep them in school until 6 o'clock? Why not keep, you know, this school calendar is crazy, right? You remember why we went to school only nine months a year? It was the agrarian calendar, because the, the parents needed the kids back to work the farms. Let me guarantee you, no one's working the farms in Camden, New Jersey. There are none, right? And so we need to readjust the way we do it. So part of what I would be advocating for is a longer school year in the United States. They do it in most other developed countries, and we need to do it. Our kids need more time. The last bit of bad news I'll give you is the latest test scores across the country, 39% of our eighth graders do not read at grade level. And 25% of our eighth graders don't do math at grade level. Not only would that not make us competitive with the rest of the world, but it also is, I think, a sin to permit those children not to be able to learn what that will mean for their enjoyment of life going forward. And so, you know, I'd be pretty aggressive in the public education space, trying to set up more choice for parents, regardless of their ability to pay, and a longer school year, because our kids need more time to learn and they'll hate us for it in the near term. But they'll, they'll thank us for it in the long term. I think that's what we need to do. So I thank you for taking a little bit of time today with me. I really do, Mary, and I thank you for letting me come um, to this great company that you've all built together. Um, I, the stuff you're doing here is really amazing. And it reminds me once again why I went to law school, because 
I would have a hard time understanding any of this. So I'm really glad that we all have our own um, skills and abilities that we can we can we can call on. But um, I appreciate you taking the time to be here, um, and I appreciate your questions. And I urge all of you, no matter what, no matter who you're going to vote for on January 23rd, to make sure you vote. New Hampshire has a unique position in American politics. You get to go first. And by getting to go first, you get to set the tone for what the rest of your campaign will be like. So you all have no excuse to complain about what the field will be or not be, because you get a chance to, to make it. And so I urge all of you, whatever it is that's in your mind and in your heart to do, to do that. But make sure you show up. Because if you don't show up, you let other people choose your future for you. And the beauty of this country is we get to choose our future for ourselves. So thanks for giving me time today. I appreciate it really very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming for hosting. Thanks for your question. Appreciate it. Thanks.